Benefactor underwriting for this broadcast has been provided by a grant from Republic Bank, The Power of Red is Back. Major underwriting support for this broadcast has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Customers Bank, Collins Building Services, Marks Panic. Additional underwriting support has been provided by grants from Amtrust Title, Bank of America, Capital One Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC, Handler Real Estate Organization, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Kesmetidis Red Apple Group, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Ocean First Bank, RPW Group, TD Bank, The One Stop Property Group, and these friends. Twenty two seasons. Can you imagine that I started a radio show? in November of 2001, which has evolved to like 1,350 shows later. So today, beginning my 22nd season, 20 on TV, I'm fortunate to have a number of real estate executives to provide their opinion on what's really happening today in the market. What's gonna happen in 2022, 23? So my guests today include the lovely Bess Friedman, who is the CEO of Brown Harris Stevens. A good-looking man, known for his bow ties, known for being a literary agent, a very prominent individual, Francis Greenberger, who is the founder and CEO of Time Equities. And last but not least, a man who grew up in Ecuador, who came here and spent time at the 92nd Street Y, okay, who's probably known as Mr. Real Estate of Westchester and also in New York City, Robert Wise, who is the founder and CEO of the RPW Group. So since we picked on you at the beginning, what's really going on today in the rental market and the for sale market? The market is just changing. It's slowing down in the residential space for sales. But as we were just talking, rates have gone up. They've almost doubled. So I think buyers are holding off a little bit and sellers are trying to figure it out. So, But the market is not awful by any stretch. It's just slowing down. What about the market? I mean, you have offices in the Hamptons. How are they doing? Everybody thought the prices were going up, 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 and it's never going to come down. Have they settled a little bit? I think that's one more of a supply issue, which is similar to what's going on in Connecticut and Palm Beach. The demand remains there in the Hamptons and all of these sort of co-primary markets where people have two homes. You know, people, there's nothing really for people to buy there, so therefore there's been a slowdown. What about with interest rates? Have, has it changed because of the mortgage situation? I don't or, see... Or people been... Not in that area, not in the Hamptons. I mean, people are, a lot of people are cash, and I don't think that factors too much into it, especially in New York City or in Hampton or in the Hamptons. Or, um, but the under $2 million market, that has more of a factor. That plays more into it. As I clarified, would you, you came from Uruguay. Uruguay as opposed to Ecuador. That's, you know, you, you've been in operation over 35 and close to 40 years? 40 years. Okay, 40 years. Are people renting out there, the office market? Yes. Yeah. It, uh, the office market is, it's, I would say, stable to a point considering the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people that did not want to commute to the city, stay in the suburbs and rented space. The, uh, the market has evolved because Westchester always rejected multifamily. And in the past 15 years, it's been a 180 degree turn. And right now there are 10,000 units completed or under construction. So people can afford to live in Westchester 
that do not have a million dollars to spend on a house. So as a result of all that combined, in addition to the fact that we have some retail base uh, with Lifetime Fitness, for example, Wegmans, and so that's making people's life easier. So now we see a lot of residential being built, and uh, so we are building 300 units that are going to be finished in the next two months. We are uh, hopefully breaking ground on 200 more in, uh, in purchase in a few months. So the market is very stable on the residential part of it, and in the office aspect, I would say that is is fairly stable as well. A lot of this has taken place because legislation and people have been user-friendly to developers now. For years, you were never able to get anything accomplished out in Westchester. That's right. And then you had all these office buildings which were really obsolete. They were built as beautiful palaces, as they would say. Healthcare has become big in Westchester, right? Healthcare is very big in Westchester. I mean, frankly, the, uh, all major hospitals are there. Uh, New York Presbyterian just purchased uh, the old Starwood headquarters to build a hospital. Uh, in one of our buildings, we have HSS with a very large facility, the largest outside of New York City. And um, Sloan Kettering is there. So the, uh, the, the, the trend started long before the pandemic. Uh, people stopped going to Florida. They wanted to be, stop moving to Florida. They, they're going to Florida for a few weeks, but they want to be close to the grandchildren. They want to play golf. They want to be around. As a result of that, you need an infrastructure for a population that is aging. So, so the, uh, the healthcare industry in general is booming and, uh, and biotechnology together with it. I mean, Regeneron which is the largest employer in Westchester, just broke ground on a billion dollar development, adding to the few billion dollars they already invested. So the, uh, the trend is clear. The pandemic, in a way, helped the suburbs. People didn't want to commute for obvious reasons. So, so Westchester is, is pretty stable. And uh, same thing with Fairfield. I mean, we have buildings in Stanford. And, um, and Listen, the office market, it's a challenging market. It's not crystal clear how this is going to evolve. We have seen a dramatic difference between tenants under 15,000 feet and tenants that are over 15,000 feet. So the, the under 15,000, they are sticky. They uh, usually are in place. Most people go to work. Larger tenants, it's, we have a variety of different alternatives. So, hard to predict. Mr. Greenberger. Mr. You, Stoller. You, you've been involved with the real estate business. For a the few. first one was a sublease, if I remember, of a property that you were able to sublease back so your rent was free. For Correct. The period of time. So let's talk about where you see the market today, partially with health care, because you've had co-op buildings, which you've so sold to medical sciences and so on. You've been downtown, you have this luxury property, 50 West Street, which is an exclusive condominium. Where do you see the world today? I was thinking, we just bought a very nice office building in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Now we own other property in Grand Rapids, which is one of, uh, not everybody knows it, most people don't know it. It's one of the 10 best small, medium-sized cities. And what's interesting is one of the things that propelled Grand Rapids, among others, they have a disproportionate number of extraordinarily wealthy people who are very philanthropic, so they have a tremendous, but they have a very, very large hospital. Uh, I think they have $25 billion invested in this wow. gigantic uh, um, research hospital uh, with major emphasis on children, which drives the city. So we just bought a Class A uh, suburban office building there, and I went out to tour it before we closed. And the, I'm going through one, th this was earlier this spring. I'm going through one space, which is leased to a, uh, uh, one of the big uh, five, I guess, accounting firms. We don't have big eight accounting firms anymore. 
at 40,000 feet. They had just redone it. And I'm being toured by the office manager and they have the best uh, air circulation systems in the world. They can make it rain, they can make it snow in the air, they can do everything under the sun. It's, it's spectacular, except for one thing. There wasn't anybody there. I said, well, this is very nice, but he says, well, you know, we have a work at home policy and our people prefer to work at home. I said, oh. Then I went and toured two 20,000 foot spaces right next to it, both of which had been leased in the last 90 days, so this spring, um, to tenants who obviously planned to occupy it or they wouldn't have just leased it. So on the one hand, you had this work at home effect, and on the other hand, you, in the middle of the spring was still pandemic time, they knew what was going on, you had two 20,000 foot tenants who had just inked their leases. So that's really the story of... of, of but of, it relates to what Robert said, the small spaces are be, being taken over by people. Yeah, well, 20,000 in Grand Rapids is not a small space. No, no, but yeah. I'm talking about... the smaller about, size. Yeah. And we see it. We, we um, see it in Manhattan, too. Although, I got to tell you, right now we're negotiating a lease in uh, suburban Cleveland, uh, 60,000 feet. Um, there's, the, the world is still functioning. But it's more of a tenant market than a, an owner's market. Well, certainly, I think New York City is a story that's different than nationally. And as you know, we own property in 34 states, so we have a pretty big perspective. And New York, in some ways, was harder hit than almost anywhere. Um, uh, and... Uh, um, you know, the New York office situation is, uh, is, is certainly not a <laughs> landlord's market, although we did just deliver a 22,000 foot floor to somebody. And it's moving. I mean, there are people, we're, we're look, currently looking for a new space downtown. We are, people are signing leases. We just yeah. signed a new lease on the Upper West Side, 20,000 square feet. So people do are committed to these office spaces. Yeah. It's just they don't need so much of it. And people, because they can work from home, I think it offers that sort of hybrid situation. But I think culturally it is very damaging for a company to let people work from home. Right. And I think in the end, I think in the end, two things are, two or three things are going to dominate the office co conversation. Word you just use, culture. Very hard to develop an effective uh, culture online. Thank you. Yes. Two, one of the most important things that businesses do are train younger people to increase their skills and become the workforce of tomorrow. That does not happen effectively on Zoom. Uh, and third, you know, people tend, the history of people, and the Hamptons and other places prove it, is that people expand their footprint. They don't tend to contract. So, uh, um, you know, I, I, somebody told me at M&T, where they had a very flexible work-at-home policy, but I think in June they said, well, if you're not back, if you have a private office and you're not back in your office by July 1, um, uh, we're going to uh, switch you to a, a desk somewhere <laughs> and assign it to somebody else. Everybody was back. <laughs> um, uh, not five days a week. No. No, that's not the new mode. The new mode is three to four days in office. So, I, and, and people aren't, you know, what do people do in the office, among other things? They store their junk. So they're not gonna give up their space even for one day or two days. So it's gonna take some settlement and there will be companies perhaps that go to on, total online. But I think in the end, those three factors that we talked about yeah, because Dominic. meaningful connection and learning and all those things are derived from interaction with I each mean, other. I mean, how can you train somebody on Zoom? I mean, I mean you, it's, it's not... It's you know, we, we not have a tenant here in the city that we were negotiating to take some space back. And uh, so we started the conversation, and, uh, and then a month into it, they call us up and they said, listen... We are not giving space back, and we like to rent the offices <laughs> next day. <laughs> so that's, that's great. Okay, it's great. <laughs> but tell me why. So we start talking to our employees. 
and especially the management level. And they all complain about the same thing. We hire a bunch of new people. We can't train them. We can't motivate them. We can't bring them into the culture of the company. So we started the conversation. What direction are we going? And, and everyone said, you know, at least three days a week they have to come. Otherwise, we have no contact with them. We don't know these people. We are hiring somebody that we never met. So end result, not only they, they did not give back space, they expanded. And I'm not saying that that's a rule by any stretch but, uh, of the imagination. But uh, nevertheless, I mean, we have leased probably 60, 70,000 square feet in the past 12 months. But it's usually five to 15,000 foot tenants. What about co-working? I think what's really going on in, in work at home is that people are expanding their residential footprint. Mm. Everybody wants, oh, I need to have a study because I'm spending time at home. Kids are driving me nuts. I can't be at the kitchen table or whatever. So residential is expanding to accommodate. Another thing that's happening, and these are the kind of buildings that we develop, um, we, we, we develop these highly amenitized buildings. In my building in Chicago, a million square feet, we have 80,000 square feet of amenities, including two full floors of co-working in the building so that our residential tenants, our primary tenants, can have. So in a way, there's a lot of competition for the, so the old WeWork model. And um, uh, there's more flexibility even within our office buildings. We're amenitizing, and we have a certain amount of co-working space. So the actual old co-working model of a discrete space somewhere else, I think is being eroded. Yeah, what I are you agree. seeing in Westchester? Yeah, I think that the, the, the magic word is amenities. Mm. And uh, we were uh, convinced of that many years ago. And we bought some of the large uh, obsolete headquarters in the, in the market and we created 50, 60,000 feet of amenities. And, uh, and now with the pandemic, we are surprised how many people are in the cafeteria and they are using the beauty parlor. And we have daycare centers in some of our buildings and practically they are almost back to normal. So amenities are big. I think that there is certainly an evolution of the co-working space, the, uh, the old fashioned just rent an office and share a conference room and a secretary is not the rule anymore. And even, even uh, WeWork has evolved in concept and uh, we see a much more dynamic environment. We have a few of those as tenants. We are not, we, we, we didn't get to the point now that you we are gonna- You didn't open your share. own. We didn't open our own. No, we are partnering on that. We just, we, we, we are happy to have them in our buildings. And, uh, but, uh, but as tenants. What about Brown Harris on that for, for co-working? You know, on occasion we've had situations where if we need to like pop people into a space and you know, they work, they, we can do that. Um, but it's not a big piece of uh, what we do or for our company is the co-working space. We have a lot of offices and agents can, if they have to work from home, if they have a computer, um, and sometimes if we're shifting a space, we can put agents in a co-working environment, but it's not a big piece of what do, we do. Do you mandate, mandate that uh, employees should come in? Yes, we, right, right after you know, we could, as soon as we, it was safe and everybody was back, we did it, t first we eased them in. We didn't want to cannonball everybody into the pool. We eased them into the pool. And so now it's full, full time. And if people don't want to come into the office, then they shouldn't work. Uh, with our company because we're a relational company. It requires human interaction and people want to see each other. Uh, and I think it's important for the future. Um, you can't really build culture on a Zoom. I don't think that will ever be the case. And I think it creates this sort of stagnation and laziness with people because you're in your, you're in your whatever, your sweatpants and you're snacking in the kitchen and the dog is barking. I just don't think, I know I'm going to get a lot of pushback on this because people want to, work from home, and you can if you have to, but... You're not as productive. 
Okay. Nobody you, is as productive. Anyone who tells you, you can't focus. Possible. You just can't. It's a diff You need to. You, you're more of a professional when you're in the office. You're dressed a certain way. You behave as when you're at home. That should be when you do whatever you want to do. Play mahjong. Do the things that you like to do. I, Read a book. I, I I totally agree with you, but very very controversial. <laughs> Very well, controversial. Well, because people and, don't want to uh, go. People don't want to go in. Yes, and it's, it's just a tough conversation to have. We are fully in the office now for a very long time. We faced in and etc. But uh, but we do recognize that it's very controversial. And uh, and depending on the industry, depending on the nature of the, we have a few tenants that are headhunters. They're having the time of their lives. Yeah. All the staff is at home. But, but very simple. They get paid for what they do. Whatever They, they, uh, they play somebody and then they get a commission. So it's, uh, it's very easy to quantify. These but wait, in her business, they, they, they rent an apartment or sell it and they get a commission also? Oh, yeah, but you don't need to show it. Here, you need to show the apartment. You need to meet the buyer. The you have tenant. to talk to them. But also think about if you don't go into the office, that impacts... The salad store, the restaurants, the subways, everything is, you know, the economy I mean, is sustained you know, by people going in, I think. You know, we're talking Midtown. Yeah. Certain streets in Midtown, the restaurants are dead during the day because there's no, not enough people. Yeah, but some are packed with you lines outside. So, some of them are completely packed there. Yeah. You can't it, get it. It just them. depends. I mean, you go at different places, you, you, you can't get into some restaurants. And it is the summer, so in the city, in the summer, a lot of people are in the Hamptons or they're in Rhinebeck or they're in Europe, and so the city has always been it's too slow. early. It's, it's too, yeah. too early to really predict. Yeah, the summer's the not too people are spending Hamptons. money. We have friends in the jewelry business. They said that they just can't find enough merchandise. People are spending money like crazy. Yeah. We recently traveled. The airports are full. The airlines are That's full. Crazy. They can't find. They can't find enough staff, so it's just a process now. We're coming out of a very awful, horrible two years. Do you see new developments being built, new, new developments planned in New York? Yeah, I mean, you probably read the news. The Zeckendorfs have a new project downtown uh, on Clarkson, a whole block, which is going to be very exciting. It's going to be like the 15 CPW of downtown. Um, and I see developers. I mean, the problem is the 421A. I think there's some concern separately that's affordable. Um, there's pencils down, I think, in that arena. But I think developers, people believe in New York City and the future of it, even when it's going through a challenging time uh, like we did in the pandemic. And uh, we need to make sure that our city is safe. I think that remains the number <laughs> one. So where are the opportunities? Where are the opportunities in the New York market? To be honest, uh, um, I think New York is a, a difficult market uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, um, uh, I think uh, um, we're finding better opportunities outside of New York. Um, Robert? I think that we are going through a process slightly different, but in a way similar to 9-11. Mm. 9-11 was one impact, was one day, and it lasted for a while. The pandemic is a little bit of a different issue. However, I will never bet against New York City. I think that, uh, that the opportunities are here if we, uh, we have a long-term view. And, um, and you just have to be very careful. It's going to be challenging for a while. I, I am a small investor with Mickey. Rubina in his new building on 43rd and 5th. So it's not like I've abandoned. Uh, <laughs> you're just, you, you just have better margins in other places. Yeah, that's a little building that he's putting up. Uh, so very very you're, small you're, building you're, on the corner of 43rd. <laughs> I mean, you know. I know, I know. So you're, you're not giving up on New York City. No, and I own a, a lot of property here, so I'm not giving up on it. But, you know, we do think nationally and internationally, and New York's got to become more competitive in a number of respects. I well, mean, politically, it, it has its challenges, po po too. Politically, it's, it's been a nightmare even though because I, we've I lost I like our water. governor a lot, and I like our mayor. Yep. You know, things, things like uh, a tax abatement. I mean, that's crazy. I know. That's crazy. If you don't have a tax abatement, you're not going to see development. Of course. People are not going to do it. It's just a difficult time. 
it's, it's, it's a tough time. I mean, unfortunately, the legislature, city council, all of those things for the last decade or so, New York City has been strangled. There's been no moderate voice. It's been these extremes. It's been the left and then the right. And so, you know, we, our city thrives when wealthy people want to live here, when people want to invest here. We don't want to drive the rich to Florida. We pay taxes, which help us have very, very progressive exactly. social programs. Exactly. They don't pay for themselves. That's, that's, but, you know, that's not a tweetable thing that's going to get a lot of attention. You're right. saying things that are factual and make sense, and people don't want to hear that. They want clickbait, and they want, you know, noisy stuff like, um, tax the rich and make and demonize the rich and that hurts the city. I don't want to compromise him, but I think our mayor understands that balance. I do too. Better than most. I do too. I, I think that we as, are, as we are at a governor. good point in the cycle because we have a solid governor and a solid mayor. And we haven't had that Correct. for a very long time. Correct. So eventually this is going to take place and it's going to start taking form and, and but let's give them a little time. I mean, we, this has been a, an awful combination of oh. terrible government, pandemic, yeah. international issues, inflation, et cetera. Well, let's, let's get back. <laughs> no, at least we have, we have harmony. You're right. Yeah. We have a harmony. We got solid leaders. It's, it's yeah, like I agree with a that. Pot. Well, we hope that, you know, with a good governor, a good mayor, and with legislation who's going to be user-friendly, the user world might be better. And Please. I'm really happy that you've all been here to celebrate my 22nd year. Congratulations. And thank Mazel you tov. I'd like to thank Bess. Thank you. Francis and Robert, and I'll see you next week. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you, Michael. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for having us here, Michael.